Karen Jeffrey Life. Hi guys, welcome to my channel and today in this video we will discuss operating system design implementation. Okay, so guys, if you have seen my previous video in that we have discussed what are the different principles which we follow while designing our operating system interface. Okay, and we discussed all the different metaphors and all the different principles related to it. In this video tutorial, we will discuss the operating system design implementation. After your open interface is ready, what are the different techniques or whatever the different approaches using which you can build and implement a operating system. So guys, the topics which we will cover in this video are operating system structures, implementation principles, what are the different principles which we should keep in mind while implementing our operating system and what are the different useful techniques which can help us while we are building the operating system. So guys, we are going to discuss all of these one by one. And guys, regarding the first thing, regarding operating system structures, I have already made and uploaded a video for this topic and the link of that video I will leave in the description section of this video. So you can click on the link and you can cover this. And today, now in this video, we will going to, uh, we will discuss the implementation principles and the useful techniques. So guys, for the full video, all of you stay tuned. So guys, th there are total seven operating system design implementation principles. Okay. So first one is mechanism versus policy. Second one is orthogonality. Then we have naming conventions and then we have binding time, early binding versus late binding. Then we have static and dynamic structures. Then we have top down design versus bottom up design. And then we have synchronous versus asynchronous communication. So guys, now we are going to discuss all of them one by one. So guys, the first implementation principle is mechanis mechanism versus policy. Now, what do you mean by policy and what do you mean by mechanism? So guys, in simple English, the policy states what is to be done the policy states what is to be done and the mechanism tells how we are going to do it how we are going to do it for example if we take a real world example in the real world example if a company says we have a policy our top managers will get this much salary our bottom bottom management will get this much salaries plus this much commission and so on so what is this this is a policy and how we implement that policy to implement that policy we need to calculate the salaries of different employees at different levels for that we use computers software people and so on so the way we implement a policy is called as mechanism okay now that was from real life now if we take the example from the operating system now suppose in operating system if we say our cpu is scheduling the processes according to the priority cpu is scheduling the processes according to the priority now which process will have what type of priority okay for example if it is a user process or versus it is a system process obviously system process will have more priority as compared to user process so deciding this priority is the policy deciding and assigning this policy priorities is your policy means system process will have higher priority user process will have lower priority and if the user process does not get the cpu after some time the user pro process priority will increase step by step so what is this this thing is called as policy and how we are going to do that how we are going to do that now you know in the operating system there is a queue in which we put all the processes which are ready to be executed then the scheduler comes and it will select one of the process according to the priority index of that process okay so it will select them one by one from the queue so what is this thing this thing is called as mechanism so guys while implementing our operating system you have to decide the different policies and we will also decide how those policies will be implemented so what do we call it we call it as mechanism 
सो गेज द नेक्स्ट प्रिंसिपल विच कम्स इज कॉल्ड एज ऑर्थोगनैलिटी सो वट इज ऑर्थोगनैलिटी ऑर्थोगनैलिटी सेज इट इज द अबिलिटी टू कंबाइन डिफरेंट इंडिपेंडेंट कंसेप्ट टूगैदर so the things which are working independently they can be combined together and they can work as one single concept so what do we call it we call it as orthogonality for example if we take the example of c language in c language we have different primitive data structure like integers characters and so on so they can work independently very nicely so we can have integer we can have a character but at the same time we can combine these integers together and we can get a integer array we can get a character array so combining the independent things together so that they can work together what do we call it we call it as orthogonality so while implementing our operating system this plays a very important role this plays a very important role for example guys when we talk about operating system when we talk about operating system everything which cpu run is a process everything which cpu runs is a process isn't it a program can be divided into process now if you see a program program is a separate independent entity okay and if you see a process it is also a separate independent entity a process can be part of a program a process can be part of a program but still a process can run independently isn't it so what do we call it we call it as orthogonality we call it as orthogonality so we can combine independent things together they so that they can work together and we can use them separately also so what do we call it we call it as orthogonality similarly if we take the example of process a process is a single entity and in process we can have multiple threads we can have multiple threads when a process is running we do not care what all threads it has or when a single thread is running we do not care to which process it belongs to both can run independently okay and both can be combined together and together also they can run so what do we call it we call this thing as orthogonality then guys the next principle which comes is called as naming by naming what do you mean by naming by naming we mean how we are going to name our data structures in the operating system how we are going to name our data structure in the operating system any data structure which is used in the operating system must have name okay and we use different types of name so when we talk about naming so naming are of two types one is called as external name naming and we have internal naming so what is external naming external naming are the ascii names or the unicode names which are given to the data structure by the humans which are given to the data structures by the humans and for the humans so what is this this is called as external naming for example i have a character a and i have a character b or i have int c this a b c all these names are given by me and they will be referred by me so what are these called as they are called as external name and other than external name so there is a naming used by the operating system which the user cannot see which the user cannot see so what do we call it we call it as internal names we call it as internal names for example in the system this is our memory this is our memory and these are the memory locations 100 120 140 150 1 60 so if i give this memory location name a and we give this memory location name b so what is the external name external names are the names given by me a and b so what are they they are external names and what is the internal name for a internal name for a is 100 internal name for b is 
140 and so on so what do we call it we call it as naming okay now guys when we talk about internal naming or external naming so there must be a structure which can map the external name with internal names which can map a external name with the internal name so what do we call it we call it as a directories we call it as directory okay so what is a directory directory is nothing but a table which can map the name given by the user with the name given by the system for example we have a we have b we have c so these are the user defined names external names okay and then this is our memory this is our memory we have 100 110 120 130 140 150 okay now what is a directory it will take the external name and using that name it will point to the internal name for example a points to 140 isn't it b points to 150 c points to 100 so what is this this thing is called as external name this thing is called as internal name and this is a directory which can provide a mapping of external names with the internal names so guys the next principle which comes is called as binding time so now what is binding time Basically, binding time is linking the data structures with the memory addresses where they will be loaded and stored when they will be executed. What do we call it? We call it as binding. Now, all of you know, all of you know when we have some program running. So before we can run the program, it must be brought to the main memory of the computer where that program will come and where it will be stored. OK, if we decide it in advance okay then it is called as early binding so early binding is easy but it is not flexible it is easy but it is not flexible means everything is fixed in the beginning everything is fixed in the beginning for example we have a process a and we have assigned a memory location of a to 1000 okay so whenever we are running that program a it must be present at memory location 1 thousand and this thing is fixed and this thing is fixed in the beginning so what do we call it we call it as early binding okay we call it as early binding and on contrast to early binding we have something called as late binding so late binding says do not fix anything in advance when the program will be executed at that time at which address it will go that time the address will be assigned to the program okay until you do not run the program no need to fix the memory location for that program so what is this this approach is little more flexible why because nothing is fixed the problem with the fixed approach is once we bind the program with the location every time we call the program okay it must go into that location whether that location is available it is very good if it is not available then that location must be made available so that this program can be stored there and executed so it is a fixed approach but what is with the late binding it is flexible so whenever we need to run the program at that time whatever the location is available we will put that program in that location so it is flexible but it is difficult to implement okay so this is the principle of binding time so whether we want to use early binding or we want to use late binding now guys if you study operating system you must must have studied something called as static loading versus dynamic loading so what is static when everything is fixed and what is dynamic dynamic is according to need so wherever the memory is there we can store the program there and execute it so guys this concept is called as binding time now guys the fifth principle is 
what type of structures data structures you will use to program your operating system whether you are going to use static data structures or you are going to do use dynamic data structure by static data structure guys i mean the data structure which are fixed in size the data structure which are fixed in size and by dynamic all of you know they are not fixed in size the size can increase or decrease according to our need and our requirement so what type of data structure you need to use while implementing a operating system for example guys in operating system we have something called as process table we have something called as process table okay now what is a process table it is a table which contains entities entries of all the processes which are being executed of all the processes which are being executed okay so if total it has 256 entries if total it has 256 entries and the system tries to create 257th entity entry and where it would tries to create 257th entry then the process table will fail why because the total capacity of this is 256 okay so what is this this is a static structure it is easy to implement it is easy to implement but because of its fixed size it is not dynamic because of its fixed size it is not dynamic so already if all the entries are full so again when you try to create another entry it will fail okay so this is the static structure now the other way of implementing the process table is implement the process table in form of a linked list so you create a table in this you create 256 entries now again if you need to create a new process okay so then what you do is create another table with 256 entries and link the first table with the second one in form of a linked list now in this what will happen no matter how many processes you keep on creating it will not be limited to 256 so when this is full add one more table to it add one more node to it 256 then again add one more node to it 256 more and keep on doing it until you do not need more processes or you do not have more memory left to create more tables so what is this this is our dynamic structure so here the designers they have to make a decision so static is easy to implement and maintain dynamic is more flexible so what type of structures they want to use whether they want to use static tables or they want to use dynamic linked lists okay and guys here in this approach there is one compromise approach also okay so which you want to use static or dynamic so what you can do is you can use the static structure you can use the static structure if it fills up suppose it 256 are already filled so one what system can do it can instead of linked list it can create another table which is double the size of 256 means it can create another table which has 512 entries and it can copy this table to that okay and if a new process is created it can start at 257 256 and it can go up to 512 okay so in this case in this case you use the static structure but you have some flexibility of the dynamic structure so guys whatever structure you have to select that has to be decided here whether static or dynamic so guys the next implementation we have already discussed it in my previous lecture in the operating system day interface design but quickly we will go through it again so that is how you are going to build the operating system from top to down or bottom to up so by top down approach says you start with the user interface and you keep on adding things to it until you reach the hardware until you reach the 
hardware. So this is the top down approach. You start with the user interface, then you add more details to it and keep on going until you reach the lowest level. So what do we call it? We call it as top down approach. Now the problem with two top down approaches. So while you are building it, you cannot test the system until you complete it fully. Why? Because you can test the top level modules, but you cannot test the bottom level module, which will actually run at the hardware hardware level. So this is the problem with this approach. So the other approach is you start with the hardware, implement the modules which run at the hardware layer, then keep on adding more details to it until you reach the top. So in that case, we can actually test the lower level modules first and ensure that they work properly. So then we go to the higher level. So what that approach is called, it is called as bottom up approach. Okay. So again, this is a decision taken by the designer, whether they have to follow top down or bottom up approach. The advantage of bottom up approach is you can test the lower level modules so that later at the top level, you do not face any problem and the problem with the top down approach is you cannot test anything from the top level until you complete all the levels so guys the last implementation point is synchronous versus asynchronous communication now if we look at our operating system our operating system is collection of many components which work together okay now the question arises how these components in what fashion they are going to communicate with each other whether the communication between them is synchronous or it is asynchronous now what do you mean by synchronous communication in synchronous communication it says if a sender sends a request to some other component okay to the other receiver then the sender waits do not do anything until it gets the response from the receiver until it gets the response from the receiver we have a sender we have a receiver sender sends a request to the receiver and it waits for response it wait for response until it does not get response it keeps on waiting or it keeps on blocking it will not do anything so what is this communication this is called as synchronous communication it is simple to implement okay but the problem with synchronous communication is if we have one sender and one receiver then it can work okay but the problem is if we have multiple senders and receivers so then when multiple senders are sending request to a receiver okay until the receiver responds all will not do anything rather all will sit and wait okay that kind of degrades the performance of the system so then the other approach is asynchronous communication where the sender sends the request to the receiver and does not wait for the response rather it sends a request and it keeps on continuing it's his job okay so when the receiver sends the response then it sends until it does not send it will instead of waiting it will continue his task so what is this thing called as it is called as asynchronous communication so asynchronous communication in a way it is more efficient than synchronous why because the sender does not wait for the receiver to respond and it can continue with the task assigned to it so guys this is called as synchronous versus asynchronous communication then again the operating system designer they have to decide whether the communication will be asynchronous or it will be synchronous or in some cases it will be synchronous and in some cases it will be asynchronous so all these decisions are taken here now guys we will discuss some of the useful techniques which can help us in designing our operating system in a better way okay so these techniques are first one is hiding the hardware then we have something called as indirection 
then we have reusability reentrancy brute force and check for errors first so guys now we will discuss each and every one of these techniques one by one now guys the first technique which comes is called as hiding the hardware okay now what do you mean by hiding the hardware they say try to hide the hardware at the early stages of operating system development now what do you understand by this hiding the hardware so you know most of the operating systems are designed to run on multiple platforms okay so those multiple platforms can have different cpus they can have different memory locations they can have different uh, uh, word size in the memory so they all different platforms will have all type of different hardware and the operating systems are designed to run on multiple platforms so what is hiding the hardware means hiding the hardware means in the earlier stages okay so when you are working at level 1 or the layer 1 or at the hardware layer of the operating system at that time only generate all the source files for all the different possible versions or for all the different possible platforms at that point okay so that at that point all the different versions can be generated and they can be tested and if there are any bugs that can be fixed at that point only okay so that later later if you we do not do that at first stage then later what will happen we will generate different versions which will run on different platforms and again all the different platforms will have different types of errors which needs to be fixed later okay so if in the beginning we hide the hardware and we generate all the source files for all the possible different platforms and fix the errors for all the different versions then later we do not have to deal with multiple errors and we do not have to debug the multiple errors so guys this thing is called as hiding the hardware okay now if you remember the layered approach in layered approach the layer 1 it deals with all the hardware and there only we hide all the hardware so that the layer on top of it they do not have to deal with the hardware they do not have to deal with the hardware and all the interrupts and interrupt handling techniques can be managed like normal thread calls can be managed like normal thread calls so what do we call it as we call it as hiding the hardware now guys the second useful technique which we can follow is the technique of indirection now to explain you indirection let me take the example of pointers no what are pointers now guys if you have uh, if you are aware of any programming languages like c c++ so here we all study the concept of pointers so what is a pointer pointer is a variable which does not hold data rather it points to the address where the data is stored okay so basically pointer it points to the data indirectly indirectly so what do we call it we call it as principle of indirection we call it as principle of indirection for example if i declare a variable a okay and then in a i store 100 so what it does what it means now a is a pointer variable which is not storing data 100 rather it is storing the address of data which is at memory location Hundred. Suppose our data is twenty. So what is this? This is called as pointer. Okay, or simply we call it as indirection. Means instead of directly uh, directly storing the data, we are storing the data indirectly with the help with the help of reference or with the help of its address. Now what do we call it? We call it as principle of indirection. And guys, while designing the operating system. we use a lot of indirection whether we are aware of it or we as a user sometimes we are not even aware of it like this thing is called as indirection for example in operating system 
okay or not 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 only operating system for example if we are using different combination of keys on our keyboard for example i press a directly and and i press shift and a then what will happen then what will happen okay now what happens when i press a directly okay so when i press it i interrupt is generated inside the operating system and when i release it again interrupt is generated now operating system knows the sequence of interrupts which interrupt was generated when i pressed it and which interrupt was generated when i released it and whether i pressed any other key combination along with a or not then what will happen operating system will interpret all these sequence of interrupts in a different way for example simply i press a and release it it will interrupt it in a different way and if i press shift a and then i release it then it will interrupt it in a different ways now if you see i am using the same key a but instead of directly printing a on my monitor the cpu or the operating system will interpret all the different interrupts and all the sequence in which i am depressing and releasing the keys and according to that it will print the different characters on my screen isn't it if shift and a it will print capital a or it may print small a depending upon your caps okay then direct a it can be big it can be small again depending upon your caps okay and so on so what do we call it instead of doing the things directly we can do the things indirectly and the way we are doing it indirectly it may mean something in the operating system and it can interpret it in a different way so what do we call it we call it as principle of indirection and guys the next prince useful technique which comes is called as technique of reusability now all of you know what is reusability okay once you have written a code for something okay so then you can use the same code to achieve something else okay what do we call it we call it as reusability first of all it saves our effort second is once we have written a code we have debugged it debugged it then same code code can be applied for different things and we do not need to debug it or we do not need to reprogram it what do we call it we call it as reusability for example in operating system if we have designed a code to manage the hard disk of operating system which will assign the sectors to the hard disk and assign the files to it and it is managing the file okay then same code can be reused to manage the memory of the computer there you have the hard disk blocks here you have the pages and lines of the main memory but basic management is the same isn't it so in the, in the hard disk you have a memory block you need to find a free block and you need to put a data in that okay same in the main memory so you have or in same in the cache memory you have cache lines and you have main memory block you need to find the free line and fit the main memory to a block to the cache memory okay so once if we design one technique okay or we if we design one code we have tested it we have implemented same code can be reused for different purposes okay so what do we call it we call it as reusability so guys then the next technique which comes is called as reentrancy now what is reentrancy i have written here for it for you it is the ability of one code to run at the same time to run at the same time or the ability of the code to be executed simultaneously so what do we call it we call it as reentrancy and guys reentrancy is used a lot when we have a multiple environment for example we have multiple cpus so there is one code running on one cpu and some other cpu can also execute that code at the same time so what do we call it we call it as reentrancy so what is the problem with this approach the problem with this 
So multiple CPUs can run the same code at the same time without a problem if they do not share anything between them. Okay, so if they do not have a common data or a common variable, then we can have our code as re-entrant. Okay, but if they share a common data, okay, so then what will happen if the common data is accessed and manipulated by the different CPUs at the same time, then what it will do? It will lead to inconsistency of data okay with re-entrancy comes one more thing we call it as mutual exclusion so when the code is re-entrant so then we have to make sure the critical sections of that code must be mutually exclusive so that our data is not in the inconsistent state so all these things are discussed or they are covered in this technique we call it as re-entrancy so guys then the next technique which comes is called as brute force now when we talk about brute force most of the people think brute force is a bad thing okay no it is not very bad thing it is always helpful while designing a very very large operation a program like our operating system now what is brute force it says no need to optimize the code okay that will be rarely used okay now you know optimization is all always always good and we study many different optimization techniques and we try to optimize all the data structures all the search algorithms isn't it now what brute force says they say if a code which is not used frequently or if a code which will be used rarely rarely no need to optimize that there is no point in breaking your head in order to optimize it just use it directly why because it will not be used frequently it will add to simplicity of your design and it will make your job easy so what brute force says no need to optimize the code which will not be used frequently or no need to optimize the code which will be used on a very rare occasions so guys, then the last useful technique, it says check for errors first. It says check for errors first. Now guys, when we talk about our operating system, in operating system, every operation we do or we want to do inside the operation operating system is translated into something called as system call. It's called as system call. Okay. So some system call to complete their execution, they may need some resources okay if those resources are not available okay then the system call will fail okay or some system call before they can be executed they need some data or they need some tables or they need some data structures if those data or data structures are used by some other system calls again these systems call system calls will fail so then what it says check for errors they say before actually you can run the system call okay so you can make sure whether the system call can run or not okay if it cannot run so then we do not start it at all if it cannot run then we do not start it at all check if a system call actually be carried out before acquiring a resources or not so we perform a battery of tests on that system calls for example ifss we have a system call it needs five resources before the system call is carried out we make sure whether these five resources can be made available to the system call or not if they can be made available then we execute this system call and we actually allocate those resources to this system call okay so if it is not possible to allocate all those five resources then we do not run this system call at all okay so that those resources are not blocked okay so th those can be given to some other system calls which may require them so what do we call it we call it as check for errors first 
before actually we run the call okay we should test it whether it can actually be performed or not if it can be performed then we continue with, with it if it cannot be performed then we return our error code means this call cannot be completed why because of this error code so what do we call it we call it as check for errors first so guys this was the last useful technique which may which we may follow while implementing a operating system so guys i think this lecture is also pretty long so that's all in this in this lecture we studied how we can actually implement a operating system so what are the different implementation principles and what are the different useful techniques which can help us in implementing a operating system plus there is a reference to the different operating system structures for that i have a separate video the link of that video i will leave in the description of this video so guys again if you like my videos please subscribe to my channel i'll be uploading more and more videos related to the information technology topics so guys all of you thanks for watching and stay tuned